to the people who are here who occupied Chicago or occupied New York, and uh, thank you. <laughs> For the moment, we're here talking about it, but um, you did it uh, and are doing it, and uh, we're all part of a big whole spark. Um, I'm going to talk about three things. I, I must have been communing with Nathan. I'll try to do it quickly. Uh, the first is uh, the internationalization, or what I would call globalism from below, or the good globalism. <laughs> because I think one of the stunning things to look about just in the last decade, I'll begin with 1999 Seattle, <clears throat> the World Trade Organization um, demonstrations, which really exposed the World Trade Organization to the world, or the 2002 International Days a pro international day of protest against the Iraq war, which was the largest international radical peace movement ever for a single uh, coordinated thing. Or uh, we, we want to remember the role that the World Social Forum has played, uh, both in form and in substance and in inspiration and in creating the, the shreds and the uh, weaving that put together globalization from below. And of course, Arab Spring. So we have Tunisia um, sparking, really, what has continued to be a series of uh, prairie fires, if you will. Um, and we can't mention Tunisia and the street vendor uh, who, uh, whose life was taken at that moment without also remembering Bradley Manning. I think it's a particularly important thing for us here in the United States to remember that WikiLeaks was also a part of kindling this uh, flame and, and that Bradley Manning has been imprisoned ever since by the United States and it's our job to get him free. Um, then we'll go... <laughs> Just briefly, of course, we know the relationship between Egypt and the Arab Spring, Madison, Ohio, the resistance on the southern tier of Europe, uh, which Vijay has just written so brilliantly about, uh, and the way in which the third world debt crisis has arrived at the shores of the first world, um, leading us to occupy. So I think it's important to watch this back and forth between countries, between the first world, the third world, and the ways in which they're mixing at this moment in time. Two, uh, the structural and institutional failure or the question of the U.S. as a declining economic power. I think it's essential that we struggle every time we talk, and I can barely make a start here, but uh, to analyze our historic moment. Where are we in the underlying forces at work in the world? Because that's the sea in which we're swimming here. And I'll just propose to you, not thinking this is the final say, that the U.S. is indubitably a declining economic power in the world, but in contradiction a voracious and dominant military power. Uh, a deadly combination, I think, but something that we need to come to grips with because uh, from my point of view it means that a lot of liberal solutions that might get proposed that harken to the New Deal or something are become preposterous. Uh, that's not the situation the United States is in. It's not going to recover the glory days of uh, so-called glory days at the cost of broken bodies, <clears throat> bombed countries around the world of an expanding empire, but in fact is in a contracting uh, economic mode. But I, I just want to note that the expanding military mode has really shifted in the last month, I think, dramatically, uh, led by the president and the, uh, the, the war powers cohort. <laughs> So I'm just going to note, of course, that NATO is a U.S. surrogate in all of this, but that we have expanding bases around China. And it's happened very fast in the last few months, I think, as a warm-up to the election. U.S. military base in Australia? You are kidding me. <laughs> um, near the opening of Myanmar and uh, Hillary's visit to Myanmar, what does that possibly mean, except if you look at a map? It's pretty clear what it means and what they have in mind in the bottom of the New York Times story. If you read to the last paragraph, always the crucial paragraph in my opinion, you will see that she is um, suggesting that they join a U.S. sponsored initiative called the Lower Mekong in, uh, Initiative, 
on water issues with Laos, where I just was, um, Cambodia, Vietnam, and uh, Myanmar. So again, look at your map, it will tell you everything. The second, uh, and Uzbekistan, so you look at where the U.S. is expanding its military powers, where the CIA is moving right now in Pakistan and Iran, and that brings me to the U.S. and the Middle East. Just briefly, you know that the U.S. troops that were not allowed to stay in Iraq um, just moved over to Kuwait, so we're going to have a permanent force, or the next permanent force there in, in, in Kuwait. New stories today about the United Arab Emirates and the U.S. role there. Uh, the Bahrain and the reason why that was untouchable during the Arab Spring because of the Sixth Fleet of the United States. The U.S. role with Saudi Arabia, Libya, Pakistan. We can go on and on and analyze it. I think it's important to do it, but of course you know that the United States actually has um, Shamsi Air Base, occupies Shamsi Air Base, another word for occupation another form of occupation. And then in South America, we don't want to forget that the U.S. Um, a year ago uh, expanded uh, the opportunity to use six um, Air Force bases in Colombia and South America. It's only a uh, close friend at the moment in South America. So I think um, what the point of this is, is to say that while uh, capitalism, I think, has shown itself to be unable to solve any of the human and social crises that we face, including, of course, uh, global warming and uh, the disaster that is being created by um, burning fossil fuels at the rate we're burning them and of waste uh, uses of water and so on. Um, you have this kind of institutional series of failures with, of all people, Larry Summers being brought in to, as the rescue. Um, the third point I wanted to make is movement building, because I think that what Occupy has done is um, not only spark a whole new sense of movement activism, but also make visible what was true all along, which is a tremendous amount of radical political organizing and activism across the country. I feel like I've been saying for 20 years, it's there, it's there, you have to just look and see it, it's never going to look like you want it to look like. It's not going to look like the 60s. It's not going to look like the 30s. It's now. But in fact, the work that's been going on um, has been thrown into relief um, by Occupy as well as been amplified by Occupy. And I think there's a fabulous dialogue going on between Occupy and the activism that's been generated for the last 20 years. Occupy is brilliant, fluid, replicable, vibrant, inventive, and I can't wait for the next chapter. I think uh, it has illuminated a structural critique of capitalism, imperialism, of social and economic inequality. And I, just to point to a couple of the dialogues that it's generated, it really shows you what's going on. I think the uh, letter from the Pelican Bay activists, have you seen this? Nathan mentioned it. But there's a new letter um, from the people, you know that Pelican Bay is the maxi security prison in California, comparable to TAMS here in um, Illinois. If you don't know about these, just Google Pelican Bay, because it's a very important place, and their hunger strike began there at a place where people are literally buried alive, largely Chicano and African American young men. Uh, and uh, it's as far away as you can get from the urban centers uh, as it is in Illinois. Uh, they went on a hunger strike, at the end of the summer, uh, and, uh, and uh, they have resumed it, I think, twice now. They, the, they just wrote an open letter to Occupy about what they have in common and where they might merge. And it's a fabulous example of solidarity. I think Occupy has generated that feeling of solidarity around labor struggles, around homeless struggles, and around uh, a lot, a tremendous amount of organizing that's going on. They find it extremely hopeful that the elements of Occupy that involve privilege or white supremacy are, um, are being, I don't want to say challenged, because it isn't really challenged, but the, the terrific, wonderful, radical energy there is being deepened um, daily by a tremendous spirit of solidarity and friendship. If you go to Occupy, or went to Occupy uh, Washington, D.C., or Occupy Detroit, you will see that they are more than half